examined every possible means for combining these symmetry elements, but there is uh, a seemingly paradoxical trick that we can yet pull. And let me, let me indicate uh, what is true here for 2mm. <coughs> Okay, so this is a two-fold axis that has mirror planes perpendicular to it. If one of these is a mirror plane, the other one has to be a mirror plane as well. So there's no way we could make one a mirror plane and one a glide plane. Okay, that requires a net that is exactly rectangular. So let's put in the two-fold axis. And if I add one to the corner of the cell, as we well know, we have to have two-fold axes at all of these other locations. If we want to put a mirror plane in the cell, we could pass it through the two-fold axis, and that would be the same as P getting two P2MM back again. But why do we have to put the mirror plane through the two-fold axis? We have to have the twofold axes left unchanged when we add the mirror plane, because if we created a new twofold axis, we'd create a, two, a new lattice and we'd wreck the, uh, the lattice that we've constructed. But why, why, oh why, couldn't we put the mirror plane in like this? That's going to leave the twofold axes alone, it's going to leave the translations invariant. Why don't we do that? Why not? <laughs> so here, trick number five, or wherever we are now. You can add the symmetry elements of a point group to a lattice, but not necessarily at the same point. You can interleave them. But the constraint is that this addition must leave. the axes invariant. Let's say, let's must leave the two-fold axes invariant. And vice versa. That is to say, the mirror planes can't create new two-fold axes. The two-fold axes can't create new mirror planes. And let's make sure we understand the reason why. If I've got a two-fold axis here and a two-fold axis here, I have to have a translation that's twice their separation. If this distance is delta, then I have to have a translation that's automatically created at twice delta. Okay. This is the same as saying two-fold axis with a translation gives you a two-fold axis halfway along. If I take the two two-fold axes, I get the translation back as a consequence. So what I'm saying is if we take a first two-fold axis and repeat number one to number two, and then add another two-fold axis which repeats number two to number three, you have a third one that is uh, related by translation of twice delta. So if you're going to interleave the symmetry elements, you have to leave the arrangement of symmetry elements at the same intervals, otherwise you would have created a translation or more that is incommensurate and incompatible with the other ones. So this is a third, a third uh, trick. And we are going to need a new theorem. Well, let's, let's first of all look at the possibilities. Uh, we can have the two-fold axis interleave with a mirror plane. Uh, how about putting a glide plane? in between the two-fold axes. In other words, replace the mirror plane by a glide plane. This two-fold axis hangs off here, reflect it across and slide it down to here, and you get this two-fold axis here. So that's also a self-consistent, compatible arrangement.
how about a centered net? And that's more difficult. Centered net has twofold axes in all the places of C2, and then twofold axes at locations like one quarter, one quarter as well. Uh, we can't put a mirror plane in here. That's not going to work because it'll generate a new twofold axis, and that changes the translation T1 to half its value. We can't even put a glide plane here because this would slide down to here, reflect across, and uh, that's, that's not going to work. So uh, the number of possibilities is limited, uh, but we'll see that there's one other case as well for a fourfold axis. OK, we need a new combination theorem that says if you have an operation a pi and combine it with a reflection operation that's removed from it by some distance delta, what is the result? Uh, that general theorem is worked out for you in the notes, but I think what I'll do in the interest of time is simply look at how this arrangement of symmetry elements would move things around. And here I've taken the a motif and hung it at the lattice point and repeated it by the twofold axis. The mirror plane would take this and reflect it across to here, and take this one and reflect it across to here and do the same thing down at the bottom of the cell. And let me now ask you what sort of plane has arisen um, that would be perpendicular to the mirror plane, could be interleaved or passed through the twofold axis. Anybody want to hazard an answer? Okay. We, we have to have some sort of correspondence theorem that says if you've got a two-fold axis, have one plane, you've got to have another plane 90 degrees away. Uh, okay, do I know how everything is related? Now, I know how this is related to this. I know how this is related to this. That's by a reflection plane. I know how the two-fold axes relate things. Uh, how is this pair related to this pair? And the answer is that the way they are related is by a, put rights and lefts on here. This is right, this is right. Reflection changes hand in this to left, so I got to have some way of getting from this pair to this pair that involves a change of hand in this. And I see nobody is really jumping out of their seat, but there is a glide plane in here. Like this pair slide it along by half of T2 and flip it across by reflection. And there's a glide plane right here. And therefore, of necessity, there's a glide plane here. And uh, this glide combined with the perpendicular translation will put a glide plane in here as well. Okay. And you look in your tables. This is plane group number seven. And this one has a twofold axis. It has a primitive rectangular net. So this is called P2M. And now the second plane at right angles is not a mirror plane, it's a glide plane. So this is called P2MG. Or there's a shorthand form. Uh, that leaves out the two. A PMG is a shorthand symbol for it. Okay, so there's a new plane group that uh, is based on orthogonal symmetry planes: one a mirror, one a glide, and two fold axes. Let me ask you now: What is the point group of a crystal that would have this relation between the atoms that are down in the guts of the crystal? What would be the point group of the crystal? We've got two different point groups. We've got point group M and we've got point group 2. So what, what, would be the, what would be the point group of the crystal? And this is a new problem, a new, new concept. And all of the plane groups that we looked at to this point 
the symmetry elements on an atomic scale down inside the point group were exactly the same as the point group that we had added to the, to the lattice points. But here we've got two different point groups that have been put into the lattice. Uh, so do we say that this crystal has symmetry 2 or symmetry M or just point group 2M? That won't work because if you have one mirror plane in a point group, you have to have another. Okay, what this introduces is a very subtle point. Um, the point group is inherently a macroscopic symmetry. When I say a crystal has a particular point group, what I mean is that if I look at the exterior faces of the crystal, uh, I would say there's a two-fold axis here, and uh, that's about all if, if these faces are pairwise uh, distinct. If I have a crystal that looks like this externally, um, I would say that that crystal has symmetry 2mm based on the faces. If I found that the etch pits on the surfaces were not quite the same on this face and this face, I would have to throw out the two-fold axis perhaps, which means this mirror plane would go out as well. But also I would do things like look at the optical properties. I would measure the conductivity as a function of direction. I would look at the uh, slip systems and yield stresses in different directions. And the assignment of a point group is an experimental observation that requires that you look at all possible properties, not only shape, but properties like conductivity and magnetic susceptibility, and also perhaps the way the crystal diffracts x-rays. That's another physical property. And then when you've done as many measurements as you choose to make, you say, as far as I can tell, all behavior of this crystal is determined and consistent with this particular point group. But you're doing macroscopic things. You are doing macroscopic things. When you talk about the plane group or space group, you're talking what goes on on a local atomistic scale in the unit cell. So what would be the point group of this crystal? Uh, it would have a two-fold axis. That would be manifested externally. It would have a mirror plane, which makes the left-hand side want to be the same as the right-hand side. And if this were not a mirror plane here, but a glide plane, what you would say is that this face, if I reflect it and slide it along by one angstrom, is going to become this face. And this face here, if I reflect it, and slide it back by one angstrom is going to become this face. But what will that do to the external shape? I just extend all these surfaces and it's going to be exactly what I've drawn here. Okay. How would you distinguish a mirror plane from a glide plane? If the crystal has a mirror plane, a face that sits here passes through some atoms. Those atoms are repeated by reflection and being slid up by an amount tau, which is on the scale of atomic dimensions, and that would give rise to a face here. But can you macroscopically assign any difference to the fact that two faces atomistically don't meet but are separated by 3.2 angstroms? No. What you see is one face like this and one face inclined to it with a slope that is the same for either a glide plane or a mirror plane. So another truth about crystals is that macroscopically a glide plane manifests itself as a mirror plane. So paradoxically, this crystal, which only has a two-fold axis and one mirror plane down in its guts, is going to look as though it has point group 2mm. Even though there is no site atomistically 
within this arrangement of atoms that has sent symmetry to MM. Okay. Yeah, sorry. That's a very good question. And actually, it, and to answer it properly um, requires knowing something about uh, diffraction. The symmetry of the diffraction pattern that you observed would look as though it had a mirror plane in it, which is to say, if we put a beam of uh, white radiation down along this direction of a crystal, imagine that these things all <coughs> extending out in a third dimension, that what we would see among the arrangement of spots is a two-fold axis in the center of the VAWA photograph. We'd see a mirror plane running this way and a mirror plane running this way. So we would see spots on the VAWA pattern which look like this. Okay. So the glide plane would also be behave as a mirror plane. And maybe if you think of what goes on with diffraction, um, if you ask yourself, if I brought in x-rays this way and diffracted them off a layer of atoms related by this glide plane, and then I can't do this actually to the crystal, uh, but suppose I then inverted the direction of the incoming beam and slid it along by five angstroms. <laughs> Doesn't make any sense. The diffraction from these planes is going to look the same whether I bring it in from one side or the other. So a glide plane in diffraction symmetry manifests itself as a mirror plane. So how can you determine the presence of glide planes using diffraction? And you can. And the answer is that the glide plane causes the intensity diffracted from planes with certain indices to be identically zero. You probably heard of these magical extinction rules, they're, they're called. Uh, and it says that if uh, h plus k plus 3 times l is 2 pi plus 4 and the crystal is green, then you've got such and such a uh, reflection being absent. Actually, um, it is, I'm getting distracted, but it turns out that glide planes affect just a row, a sheet of reflections in reciprocal space. And the reason some reflections are absent is that that sheet of reflections corresponds to what the projection of the structure onto that plane would do. And if you project a structure that has a glide operation into a, onto the plane of the glide plane, the structure looks like the lattice translation is half as big. And if that's the case, the diffraction spots are twice as widely separated. Okay? And it turns out that all of the reflections that are, uh, have an index corresponding to the direction of tau are absent if those, uh, that index is odd. Okay? So if you knew a little bit about it to begin with, that perhaps answers the question. So yes, you can determine the presence of glide planes. And later on, we'll talk about screw axes. You can determine their presence unambiguously, but you do that not from the symmetry of the diffraction effects, but from systematic absences. Okay. okay. Um, another thing I suggested we could do is to put a glide plane in between the two fold axes instead of a mirror plane. And this says that if I have a pair of atoms repeated by the two fold axis, the glide plane would take that pair, shift them down by half of the cell, and reflect them over. So this would be the pattern of objects. Uh, this is not a lattice point, because if these are right-handed, that's a right-handed pair. This is a left-handed pair. Now let me try you again. Uh, I know how these guys, left and right, to this glide plane are related. How about these ones that are up to the ones that are down here in the, in the middle of the cell? There's got to be 
from our correspondence principle, some plane going in this direction. Anybody want to hazard a guess of what it is? The answer to that question resoundingly is no, not at this hour of the afternoon. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, very good. Uh, right ones have to go to left ones, and they are going to go left and right about these planes here. And if I combine this glide plane with T2, there has to be another glide plane in here. If I combine this glide plane with T1, there'll have to be another glide plane in here. Okay, uh, and that turns out to be plane group number eight, P2GG. Now P2MN, both mirror planes have become glides. All right, we're almost there. If you look at uh, the hexagonal symmetries, uh, there is just no way that you can interleave things, and uh, that's an attempt is made in the notes that I handed out. Uh, you just cannot do it. But with um, P4M, P4, there is one final possibility, and I'll just set that up and not carry them out. Okay, I'm going to put on just P4. with two-fold axes in here. And now we have planes that go in orientations like this. And then there is another plane 45 degrees away that is a symmetry-independent plane. And the question now, I'll let you have a crack at it. Is there any way in which I could take planes in the diagonal orientation or parallel to the cell edge and interleave them in between the rotation axes in such a fashion that the rotation axes were left invariant. And again, conversely, if they're not left invariant, we will have created new translations and wrecked the lattice. So how could we slip in planes, either reflection or glide, and leave the axes invariant? Mm, yeah, you want, how do you want, parallel to the cell edge? Uh, horizontal. horizontal? Yeah. Um, this locus here has a fourfold axis up, a fourfold axis down, a fourfold axis up, twofold axis down, twofold axis up, twofold axis down. So this would be a lovely location for a glide plane. So that's one. Uh, from the fact that uh, I am placing the same diagram on the board yet again suggests that there's another way. That's a perfectly good suggestion, and that's one of the things we would have to examine. Is there any other way I could put in a mirror plane or a glide plane and leave the axes invariant? Yeah. 45 degrees, uh, uh, okay, through here. I don't want to do it through here because the fourfold axes sit on the same side, but I could, you want to put it in like this? No, I don't think you can do that. Okay, uh, glide plane won't work here. How about a mirror plane? There's no mirror plane that goes through these two-fold axes for P4MM. What we had there were mirror planes here, and then going this way were glide planes. We've already got that. How about putting in a mirror plane like that? This goes into this. Uh, Halfway along, there would have to be another mirror plane in that orientation. Here's a two-fold axis. That demands that there has to be another one if 
it passes, has a mirror plane passing through it. So there's another way. Um, one final one, and I will not uh, keep you guessing anymore. Um, sneaking a peek at the answer. Um, there is another way you could do it, and that would be to put the glide plane down diagonally through the cell. And that is put the glide plane here. That would take this two-fold axis, reflect it across to here, and slide it down to here. So this two-fold axis would be related to this one by glide. So those three possibilities are available for point group 4MM and uh, a square net. If you try them, and the simple way of doing it without any general theorem would be to draw in the way the symmetry elements repeat the motifs and then ask uh, what they uh, require for the remaining symmetry elements. All of these give the final result. So they yield the same result. You can develop a general theorem for what you obtain if you have an operation A alpha combined with a plane and make it a general plane, a glide plane, uh, that is removed from the axis by some distance uh, delta. And that theorem is uh, written out for you in the notes. On the very first page, you take a glide plane, and this is for a specific example, a pi. If you have a glide plane that misses a twofold axis by some distance delta, then the effect of those two successive operations is a glide plane at 90 degrees to the first, and it's removed from the twofold axis by two delta. It has a glide component, excuse me, it has a glide com component two delta. So there's a general theorem for the two-fold rotation. The general theorem for a four-fold or a three-fold rotation is considerably more complex to derive, but that's contained for you in the notes as well. All right, we've come to the end of one other major part of our story of symmetry. These are the periodic patterns in a two-dimensional space, and these are then the 17 crystallographic plane groups. Crystallographic is rather redundant because they are groups that have in translation, and therefore these are the symmetries, the two-dimensional symmetries that are suitable for the atomic arrangements in crystals. As a little bonus, we also have, as a result, 17 of the three-dimensional space groups. Just imagine each of these plane groups with a translation perpendicular to the plane of the plane group, and that would leave all the symmetry elements coincident. So you could pick a third translation at right angles to the blackboard of any arbitrary length, and you would have a three-dimensional lattice that contain the symmetries of a plane group. I think I mentioned earlier that the way you distinguish a plane group with a two-fold axis in it from a space group with a two-fold axis is that a lowercase letter for the lattice type implies plane group. And an uppercase symbol, capital P, stands for a primitive lattice in a space group. So uh, something like uh, lowercase p4mm is a plane group, capital P4mm is a space group with a third translation of arbitrary length at right angles to the plane group. Okay, let's 
we talked about plane groups and space groups. Let's take a giant leap backwards. How about the one-dimensional space groups? Bet you were wondering about them all along and were afraid to ask. So what would be the story for one dimension? It's non-trivial. Um, uh, a one-dimensional space group uh, would be a lattice row. You have just one dimension to play with, and you can make that space periodic by translation. So there's one lattice type, just a lattice row. And what sort of symmetries could you place in that lattice? Uh, now you have to define your, your, your ground rules. Uh, in our two-dimensional symmetries, we did not permit any operation which would pick the two-dimensional space up and ro rotate it and flip it over and put it down again because that is a transformation that takes you out of that space and pops you back into it. And we will not, in our discussion of three-dimensional crystallography, consider symmetries, operations that take something, suck it up into a fourth dimension that we can't comprehend, and then all of a sudden pop it down in again, and suddenly it appears. I mean, that sounds bizarre. We wouldn't want to do that. So for plane groups, we did not allow for any operation, say a two-fold axis, that would flip the object over and turn it upside down. But why not? I mean, this is mathematics. Uh, it's, if it's your ball game, you can make up the rules. So why couldn't we have a two-fold axis in the plane of the plane group? We would have to leave the net invariant. Well, actually, such entities do exist, and they have been derived. They're called the two-sided plane groups. And if you want to allow that when you make up the game, you can actually do that if you wish to allow it. Uh, and also, there could be a mirror plane in the plane of the space that would take the top side and relate it to the bottom side. So you can do that. You can permit that. That's a different, different beast entirely, but you can allow that to be one of the transformations. So for our one-dimensional space, I would submit to be consistent with what we've done and just finished in two dimensions and what we'll do in three, we will not allow for any operation that will take this space and transform it into a second or third dimension and then put it down again. So that being the case, the only operation that is possible is a mirror point that would reflect things left to right. And let me illustrate now with some patterns. Um, There's the lattice point, so let me put in some motifs. And I have to make a one-dimensional motif, but to dis distinguish the ends, I'll take a little artistic license and make one end of the motif a little fatter than the other. Or alternatively, I could put a little one-dimensional headlight on this thing that would shine just in one direction. So here is a motif hung on every lattice point. And so this is no symmetry at all. So the symmetry part of the symbol would be one. And the lattice is primitive. And what do you think people use? We used lowercase symbols. We used uppercase symbols. What's left? Yes? Good try. Gothic. <laughs> <laughs> so actually, what you do is you use uh, a Gothic symbol with all these nice little uh, shaded angular shapes go. That's a gothic P, isn't it? Yeah, that's a gothic P. Um, it is. It actually has thick and thin parts, curved parts. Of it. So that's P1. Um, what about another symmetry? Well, if we have a mirror point in there, another possibility would be to have these uh, motifs point alternately left and right. So I'll take some non-one-dimensional license and say that there would be mirror points at these locations. Really nice, nice symmetry, but actually it would be totally wasted on these poor denizens in a one-dimensional world. Life would be dull and interesting because they couldn't see anything except the motif on either side of them. 
because everything is constrained to one dimension. There's an old saying about uh, sled dogs that says if you, if you are not the lead dog, uh, the scenery is not very interesting. And the same is true for these pure, poor people in a one-dimensional world. They could never see the elegance and beauty of that. But in any case, that would be Gothic P, no sniggers, please. And that would be M. And those are the only two possibilities in a one-dimensional space. Okay, we have a couple minutes to go, but I think this is a good place to pause. And I'll give just a brief indication of coming attractions. Uh, we're now going to look at point groups in three dimensions. And a good way of entering this much more complex situation is to go back to something analogous to what we did for two-dimensional symmetries, and I'm going to first consider the arrangement of rotation axes in three dimensions. We do not have the constraint that all the rotation axes be perpendicular to the plane of a two-dimensional space, being therefore more properly rotation points. So you've got three dimensions we have to view a rotation axis as extending infinitely in a direction, and there's no reason why we can't have another rotation axis at an angle to it. But you know that already. Everybody's heard about cubic crystals. Uh, even if you think all crystals are either body center cubic, primitive cubic, or face center cubic, or complex, four kinds of lattices. Uh, but you've heard of cubic crystals, and the cubic crystals, clearly the rotation axes are inclined to one another in a range spatially. So we're going to ask the non-trivial question. How can we combine more than one rotation axis at a time about a common point in space? And the constraint is going to be that a rotation about the first axis followed by a rotation about the second axis, wherever it is, is going to have to turn out to be something that is crystallographically compatible with a lattice. So that's the constraint. Um, it's not an easy question. And uh, just to make you feel proud of yourself when we get through this, this uses a geometry that uh, is due to one of the great mathematicians of all time, Leonard Euler. Uh, probably the most remarkable thing about Euler was that he's Swiss. How many world-class scientists have you heard of that come from Switzerland? Not very many, and the reason is it's such a small uh, country, and if genius occurs as a certain fraction as a pop of the population, it's not going to happen very often in a country like Liechtenstein or Switzerland. Have you ever heard of anybody prominent in science who came from Liechtenstein? No, probably not. Okay, this then is going to be a, a non-trivial piece of mathematics uh, for us, largely because it involves spherical trigonometry which I'm sure if you've ever heard of, you've forgotten and probably don't see any utility in it. Okay, with that exciting prospect in hand, I look forward to seeing you on Thursday. <laughs>